Good evening, everybody. How you doing? Pat Dorsey here from the Blue Quill Angler. Just got off the river and came home now and looking forward to tonight's uh, Facebook Live. Plan on tying uh, a few of my favorite signature patterns. Tonight we're going to tie the uh, Matt's Midge, a high-vis Griffith Nat, and a bread crust. And if I have some time, I'd like to tie a little uh, trailing chuck uh, midge imitation. So I think most of you out there know that I'm a tailwater enthusiast. And for us that uh, enjoy fishing those tail races, we all know the importance of midges. What they lack in size, they make up in numbers. So everybody that's a tailwater enthusiast should really familiarize themselves with the different stages of the life cycle of the midge. So you want to have some larvas in both pale olive and red. Pupa tend to have shades of brown and black. And then of course, during the height of a midge hatch, you want to be able to match the hatch. And one of my favorite patterns over the years has been Matt's midge. I met Matt Miles back on the Williams Fork back in the early 1990s and certainly has been one of the most amazing experiences of my life, one of the most talented individuals of my life. And, uh, this pattern here is a pattern that I think all tailwater enthusiasts uh, have to have. So I've got a picture here. Uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, put a uh, Temco 101 into my vise. Typically tie this in sizes 18 through 24. And it's important to realize that not all midges are small, particularly during the spring season, it's important to upsize your midges. In other words, we fish the big spring midge can be sizes 18, oftentimes referred to as a gorilla midge. So again, a wide range of sizes is very, very important when you're tying this particular fly. I'm going to begin with a jam knot behind the eye. This is an 8 aught uni thread. And we're going to simply advance the thread back forward with symmetrical wraps to create a nice, smooth, segmented body. Once we get back towards hook bend, we'll bring the thread back forward once again using the same technique with these smooth, touching, symmetrical wraps until we get back into that thorax area. The wing is tied from a little clump of Zelon. We'll square the ends off and we'll attach that wing into place. And the wing should be clipped off about the same length as the abdomen. Next is going to be the hackling. We're going to use a Whiting Farms Grizzly. I'm a big fan of the 100 packs. I do a lot of the 100 packs just because it's uh, very, very simple. Particularly when you're commercial tying, it just saves a lot of time and effort. We'll attach the hackle into place, dull side up. And then we'll palmer that hackle forward. Usually about four turns of hackle is sufficient. And then we'll whip finish. Don't let the simplicity of this pattern fool you. It's surely one of my favorites. And it has caught selective fish all over the western United States. You can come in and trim a few of these hackle fibers off. And you have a completed fly. My good friend Matt Miles also ties a high-vis variation of this. So that's another option for those high glare situations.
Typically fish this on a 6 or 7x tippet. Typically prefer a downstream approach in most cases with a reach mend or some sort of specialty cast so that the fish sees the fly before anything else. It's a deadly little pattern again. Recommend carrying it in sizes 18 down to a 24. The next pattern I'm going to tie is, is a cluster. And I'm not sure if you've ever had the opportunity to fish the big horn of San Juan. If you have, it's uh, really explosive dry fly fishing, particularly this time of year. And the pattern that I'm going to be tying here is going to be a Griffith gnat. The Griffith gnat has been uh, one of the best midge imitations of our time. You can tie a standard variation of the Griffith gnat as well as a high-vis Griffith gnat, as you see in the tip of my vise. The Griffith gnat in uh, bigger sizes is a great cluster, and tied in smaller sizes can be an individual midge. I can remember one of my first experiences with clusters was on the bighorn. My wife, Kim, and I were floating down uh, below three mile, and we were coming down into the snag hole. And I re just remember looking at the surface of the water, and it, it was amazing. There was midges that just blanketed the water's surface, and it was one of the most amazing sights I've seen and, and some of the best dry fly fishing that I can remember in recent memory. I'm going to begin here. I'm tying this at, um, in a size 18 Tiemco hook. Again, you can tie these up to a 16, even a 14, believe it or not, and then again all the way down to a size 24. But the beauty of this pattern is if you tie it um, heavily hackled, you can use it for a dry and dropper rig. You can fish it as a single midge, and I tie a lot of different variations, which I'm going to show you here in just a minute. But let's begin with a jam knot behind the eye of the hook. And we'll advance the thread back forward. I typically tie the post out of McFly lawn, which is great for any parachutes or any high vis patterns, mainly because. It's consistent. If you're looking for a consistent um, high-vis betas or any high-vis patterns, you really become a fan of this. Um, Darlon works well. You can use Antron as well. We'll simply take a clump of the McFly lawn and we're going to secure that into place. Come in and clip off the butt ends and then we'll bury those butt ends with some thread. The next step is going to be propping up the post and putting a thread wedge in there. Taking a look at a couple of these comments here. A lot of people from back east, hello from Georgia, Mississippi, Missouri. It's great to see everybody this evening. Thanks for tuning in. I really appreciate it. Let's uh, clump this up now. And we're going to just bundle this up. Similar to any type of a parachute post. And we'll advance that thread back towards hook bend. Now, some people would choose to put maybe a drop of cement on that and that's fine as well too. Now the next thing is is we're going to use some peacock curl and I'm a huge fan of the peacock eyes. I buy the peacock eyes in bulk and the advantage to using the hurl that comes in eyes is mother nature's sized this for us which is really nice. If you look at the actual stem itself and the wide variance of sizes, when I'm tying small nymphs, I'll choose a small pearl like this. If I'm tying collars on 
like my son's Manhattan Nibs, this is the type of stuff I want to use. If I'm tying big and bushy um, nymphs, like Prince nymphs or something, I might use this. Um, Griffith Nats, I tend to use a little bit fluffier hackle as well. But the beautiful thing is, is the peacock itself is smaller at the base of the stem, and as it goes up the feather itself, it gets bigger and bushier. So it gives you the flexibility to change the density and the fluffiness of it. Another thing that is important when you're tying with um, peacock hurl is I'll typically take two pieces of hurl off and if you look at the composition of the hurl the butt of the hurl has a very thick stem and the tip of the hurl is very flexible. If you tie this in butt first you're going to mash down those fibers and that's not going to produce a very good looking fly. So typically what I do is I clip off about three quarters of an inch there and I'll come in and I'll tie that peacock curl into place. I have two strands, again tied in tip first. Coming back to my Whiting Farms Grizzly Hackle. And typically what I do is I tie these super heavily hackled. Tie in the stem, advance the thread forward up towards the eye of the hook. And really this is to the tire's discretion on how much hackle you want to use. But I typically use a lot of hackle so that I can suspend a dropper if needed. And keep in mind, we're imitating a midge cluster here. So I'm not sure if you've ever had that opportunity on the bighorn. I've been on the bighorn where I've seen clusters the size of dinner plates on the side of my drift boat. And it's pretty darn exciting. I mean, there's times when uh, a chunk the size of a, a, a dime or a quarter will break off and you'll watch a fish come up and grab that whole cluster. Pretty, pretty amazing. So we'll advance the peacock curl forward. Be careful that you don't catch that hook point right up to the wing. And we'll advance that a little bit further forward past that wing. Take a couple material locking wraps there and snip off the remaining. And we'll come back in now and we're going to palmer this forward. Again, I'm really going to lay that hackle in there tight. Bring that forward. Take two material locking wraps there behind. A couple in front. And then we're going to whip finish this off. Final step is going to be to clear off some of that hackle that gets in the way and then you're going to go ahead and clip off the wing. The wing should be approximately one hook shank length long. We'll come in here and just trim that wing off just like that and just frizz that out a little bit. I'll tell you another uh, great um, advantage to this fly is we've all been in a situation where uh, we have heavy glare, it's hard to see the fly, so it works great in that type of situation, but this also works very well for a locator fly. So if we're fishing like a 24, 26 Adams um, during the height of a midge hatch and we're having difficulty seeing it, or any other small dry fly for that matter, what we need to do is put this fly first and then trail our little midge dropper behind it. So you can actually see this fly a lot of times you can't see the trailer, but if there's any type of surface activity or rise around this fly, then assume that they have taken your fly. So it's a very, very uh, versatile fly from that standpoint. You can fish it as a cluster, a single midge. You can fish it for, um, you know, dry and dropper situations, or you can use it as a locator fly. So truly 
pattern I highly recommend that you stock in your fly box. Some reason I'm not getting my comments coming. Okay, we're going to move on to the next one now. Um, this is a little trailing shuck pattern, and you know I I really um, realized the importance of a trailing shuck pattern when I was down um, on the river with my friend uh, Tony, our, our shop manager. And we were watching midges hatching right on our waders. And you could see them crawling right up to the surface and crawling out of their, their shuck. And it was amazing when you looked at that and you could see how that midge looks actually twice its natural size. And that's when I really realized how important that a trailing shuck midge pattern was. So I tied this pattern up. It's um, kind of a, a souped up Matt's midge with a trailing shuck on it and it has become one of my favorite dry flies particularly during this time of year. So we're going to begin with a Timco 101 and we're going to start with some thread and same thing, this is an ADOT Uni thread. I'm going to use a little piece of brown Antron for the shuck. If you look at the shucks on these midges, a lot of times you'll see them along the river's edge. They, they're kind of brown and white. And that's why when I designed the top secret midge, that's why I went with that, that body scheme where it was kind of a brown and a white. But they're, they're, um, they're kind of that... Uh, amberish brownish color so that's why a little piece of this you can use zelon you can use darlon i'm going to tie this in and then we're going to advance the thread back over the top of this darlon right back towards hook bend and then we'll advance the thread back forward once again to that thorax area. Now we're going to clip off the trailing chuck and I like to have it about the same length as, as the body. And this is going to use a little loop wing. So I'm going to clip off a little bit of white Zelon tied into place. I'm going to bring that loop wing, I'm going to bring this back just a little bit further. And I'll leave this extend forward because I'm going to tie in a, use those for the antenna. The next thing that I'm going to do is tie in a grizzly Hackle once again. This is some rooster, of course. And then tie in a nice small piece of peacock curl, a little bit smaller than I used for my Griffith net. Tip first once again. We'll palmer that. Peacock hurl forward. Take a couple material locking wraps. Then we're going to palmer our grizzly hackle. Take a couple material locking wraps to secure that in place. Clip that off. And the final step is going to be to come in front of that. And if you ever look at adult midges, 
you have a very, very prominent set of antenna there, gills. We're going to whip finish that off. Snip the thread there. And then clip off the antenna. Question is, is a uh, good reliable pair of tying scissors. You know, uh, I use a lot of different tying scissors. Um, I like the, the Umqua scissors. I use them a lot. I have those sitting right here. I have a pair of uh, Sologen scissors that I've been using for many, many years. And um, I just like, in all honesty, I like a pair of scissors that, that sits flush in my, in my hand. That, that's one of the most important things. Hello, Canada. Good to hear from you. Scotland, my gosh, goodness, it's uh, all over. It's uh, a pleasure that uh, everybody's tuning in tonight. Thank you very, very much. Now we're going to move into uh, another pattern here that has truly been one of my favorites over the years, and it's a it's a bread crust, and it's it's we get into the caddis season. We can't uh, have too many caddis pupa and caddis patterns. And, and this is a pattern that uh, I was very fortunate to have learned how to tie from Ed Rolka. I'm going to put one in the vise here. And I, I tie them in a variety of colors and a variety of styles. This is just a standard um, beadhead bread crust. I also tie it with a tungsten variation and recently I've started tying it in a jig version which has been probably one of my favorites and I'm using this uh, new X series hooks the uh, super jig 60 so if you're looking for a good jig hook um, I'm a big fan of this hook right now but the uh, jigged bread crust is is a nice alternative to the original pattern Probably the biggest challenge to the bread crust is, is finding the materials. And it's a red phased rough grouse is what the original pattern calls for. And it's a, it's a beautiful bird. But also, I have um, dyed some feathers and also do a uh, olive variation with a matte black bead. And you can see how beautiful that is with uh, olive. And then also don't forget about just the gray phase. The gray phase is, is uh, probably more common than the red phase. So you really have three different color schemes and the uh, gray probably is the most realistic of all of them when you really look at, at cased caddis. So those are some things to think about and no doubt that the, the greatest challenge to tie in the bread crust is the preparation of the materials. And I want to try to um, sink my teeth into that right here a little bit and just show you how to prepare the materials and show the importance of doing a lot of tails at one time. I typically will prepare a whole bag full. You can see here, this is, this is mind boggling when you look. This is probably five tails that are prepared right here. And that's the key, is, is the preparation. So what you'll do here is you'll take one of these feathers out of the fan itself. And then I'll begin by clipping off the tip of the feather and also the base of the feather. The next step is going to be to trim the barbules so that they're about a sixteenth of an inch from the actual quill. And what I'll typically do is I'll prepare a bunch of these at one time. and then I'll float them in water. And what we're gonna do now is we're gonna float this in water and I'm gonna 
go ahead and advance into the next step here. Get a razor blade. We're going to tie this. This is a um, Tiempco 5262, which is a 2x long hook. And I typically tie these in sizes 12 through 18. If you look at caddis, and there's some really big caddis in, in, in particular, rivers case caddis. I mean, on the Gunnison, it's amazing how big some of, of them get, but. Um, that's why I tie them in a wide variety of sizes. The most important thing when tying the bread crust is to get that bead on and get it on properly. So I'll begin with a jam knot right behind the bead and then I'm going to use a 6 aught dark brown thread and I'm going to take several wraps of thread and create a little thread wedge behind the bead itself. And that'll get that bead straight. And that, that's probably the most important thing from the beginning. It's just making sure that that bead is on nice and straight. The underbody is some four strand brown yarn of which I will take two strands and just separate those out. I typically use two strands on my 12s and my 14s and typically use one strand on my 16s and 18s. Begin by securing that yarn into place. And then I'm going to wrap that yarn around the shank of the hook back towards hook bend. As I produce this underbody, the most important thing now is to pack this a little tighter with each wrap so that I start to develop a slight taper. If you need to, you can come back and develop that taper. Take a couple material locking wraps. And secure that into place. Now the next thing is probably the most tedious part of this is, uh, grab a drink here. is splitting the quill. And this is what really kind of freaks people out a little bit. And it's the reason that we sell so many flies at the shop is the actual preparation of this quill. We're gonna take a, a razor blade. This is an old double-edged stainless steel blade. And we're gonna take this blade and we're going to come right down the middle. And this may not have been soaked long enough, but I'm going to try to give you an idea of what I'm doing here. So I'm coming right down the middle of this feather, literally removing the top off the feather and keeping trimming the back off it. To where you have, somebody wanted me to explain the soaking. So the soaking is important because the material is so difficult to work with and it's so 
rigid. So by soaking it, I was able to actually take off the back. And you'll see now here we have just the pith of that feather inside. So what I'll typically do is I'll prepare several tails at a time. Somebody says the, the X series are legit, no doubt. That's a great jig hook. I'm, I'm so psyched with that jig hook. Now the final thing here, again, keep in mind, we're just doing one at a time here. But the next thing that you want to do is I've got an old piece of walnut here. And we're going to take this feather. I'm going to take it and actually scrape this feather. And this is going to be hard for you to see, but I'm going to do my best right here to actually scrape this out of there and you can kind of see what I've done and I soak it back in water again and I have another one that I prepared that's going to be a little bit more um, pliable I'm going to use that one so what I'll do, like I said, is I'll prepare, you know, five tails. And I'll sit down and watch a ball game, watch a little golf, whatever. And I'll prepare the, the tails. I'll put them in a bag, like I mentioned a little while ago. And then when I come back to tie the fly, I'll actually just reach into the bag and then put them into the water. So it really simplifies things. So I'm going to tie in this grouse quill now, which in theory is nothing more than a big biot. And we're going to start to wrap this around the shank. And you can see as you start to spin that, this is one of the most incredible looking cased caddis that you could ever tie. We'll clip off that material. And don't get rid of this piece right here because now... This is the uh, kind of the butt end. What I do is I'll actually take this and split it in half right down the middle. And you'll see that I'll have two of them now. And I can tie size 16s or 18s with the smaller ones. What I'll do is make sure that I've secured that in place. And, and one of the most important things and it's with all flies is and we've all been guilty of this for many many times is making sure that we don't crowd the head and this one is a, one that's a, a great example of that uh, the collar is going to be tied with the traditional wet fly type approach and this is a, a grizzly hen whiting farms grizzly hen and I buy oodles and oodles of these things um, because I tie so many bread crusts commercially. I, I, I can't even begin to tell you how many of these I've tied, and, and we just can't keep them in stock at the shop. So we'll pull off a nice grizzly hen here to tie a, a collar. I'm going to strip all that webbing out of there. Secure that into place. And then I'm going to grab my hackle pliers. And we're going to just do a nice little collar. That I usually do three to four turns. Just like that. Pull off that excess material. Strip that off. I apologize. For some reason, my comments aren't scrolling through and I'm not sure why so I apologize if anybody is and we'll just make a nice little collar here and they'll whip finish it this is one of the few flies that I actually use head cement traditionally on and I'll put a little dab of head cement in there 
to complete the fly. So if you're looking for a, a great cased caddis imitation, uh, I would recommend the, the beadhead bread crust to be one of your favorite ones. I'm going to close up with uh, a pattern that uh, my father taught me about as a young man. And, you know, it's, uh, I'm a little teary-eyed right now because my paw's a bit sick, so this means a lot to me. It's a renegade. Spent a lot of time in the Gunnison Valley fishing with my father. And uh, this was his favorite fly, and it's truly one of my favorite flies. Going to begin by clamping a... This is a Tiemco 100. And you know, this this fly is, is an oldie but a goodie. And it's uh, it's an amazing attractor. I mean, in small sizes, works good for midges, but it, it's just, it's just a, it's one of those flies that it works. It, it's, it's deadly, you know, and you can tie it with a tag. The original, the original pattern calls for a tag. So just a little bit of Mylar tinsel and, uh, I'm going to tie it like the original pattern calls for. And this is, this is just, it's one of those, those patterns that you can't live without. Begin with the jam knot. And we'll advance this little bit of tinsel back. Right towards the bend of the hook. And we're going to have this gold tinsel here. We're going to take a couple turns of the gold tinsel. And that's just referred to as the tag. I think it's just a little bit of a, a flash tractor. And, it, you know, it uses a brown hackle. This is a fore and aft style. And uh, it's been used for many, many years. I'm going to pull out and get a size 14 brown. And we'll get a size 14 white. Again, I'm just such a huge fan of these 100 packs. It's just such a great way to accumulate a lot of good quality hackle at a reasonable price. And I hate to admit it, but I've got a hackle addiction. And I know a lot of people in our industry have it too. I think Chris Johnson, my buddy down in Round Rock, and so many of my buddies, you just there's something about good quality hackle and Whiting Farms produces the best there is. So we're going to begin with the brown hackle. And we'll take a few turns here. We'll tie that off. And then as we've discussed before, the importance of some peacock curl. You can use two or three. Some people even use a little bit of wire to actually enhance this, but I usually just tie in a couple pieces of peacock curl. And then I'll just advance this back towards the hackle, and then you can just build up a nice little. body there. I'd like to have a little bit fluffier, but I think you get my point here. And then we'll come in with a little bit of white hackle here. Tie that in. Take a few turns. 
forward there. And you have a little renegade. Trim off a couple of these stragglers. And there you have it. One of the oldies but goodies, but certainly um, one of those flies that has a tremendous amount of sentimental value to me. And that one's for you, Dad. I want to thank everybody for tuning in. I really appreciate the opportunity. Sorry I had to cancel on you last couple weeks ago, but just had some challenges as, as of late. So appreciate the opportunity to do it again and look forward to uh, seeing everybody on the stream. Thank you.